time to come. And I want to thank you for that. I want to thank you for all your support. Rough Comics this is a great thing that we're doing here today. And uh, I really wish I could stay, but there is a video. Are you going to be able to show it? I, I, I don't know. No, no. There's a you said you showed it off an iPhone somehow. Somehow. I don't and know. The internet down here is, is spotty. But I, I, I didn't want to diss you by not showing up, but I have to run. So uh, I appreciate your support, and you can email me or Facebook friend me at any time, and we'll share work on my new project coming up is about seeing the Beatles, and it'll be out at XPX this time next year. Right? I saw him in person at 13, and I kept a journal about it. And that book is going to be here. So enjoy today. i got to go. Thank you, Carol. Have a great trip. <laughs> Carol Tyler, everyone. Please buy her book, A Soldier's Heart. If you haven't already, goodbye. Good luck with the screening at the airport. Uh, that was Carol Tyler, everybody. Uh, this is a live show. Um, people ask me about, why do you read comics? Like, what's the point of reading comics? People can read comics themselves. Why have people come on stage and read them out loud? I think there's something really dynamic about having people present their own work in their own words. And I've watched people read their work. And even just seeing Carol here, it gives you a whole other dimension of uh, the mind behind the comic, uh, or the personality behind the comic. So um, I've been doing these shows for a while, and um, I have an amazing cast of uh, uh, cartoonists today, uh, including, well, you just saw Carol Tyler, but we also have Sophie Goldstein. <laughs> Roger Landridge. <laughs> Jeffrey Brown. Andrea Sarumi and Pascal Girard. And who knows what other cartoonists will have to run to catch a plane. Um, actually, I do know one of the people who's going to have to run to catch a plane, and he's going to go first. Um, and I'm going to read you his bio. I'm R. Sikoriak, by the way. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Um, oh, my goodness. Where is everything? Uh, that was, I wasn't expecting the, uh, the, uh, the little, uh, that little introduction uh, from Carol. I knew she did have to go though, so I was prepared for that. Let me open up this file and just read everyone's intros. Um, oh, I'm so sorry. We started, we started a couple minutes early. How are you all doing? <laughs> Good. Um, so our first, our first guest is the best-selling author of Darth Vader and Son and the Jedi Academy books. He began his career with the comics Clumsy, uh, the autobiographical, autobiographical comics Clumsy and other comics of that um, nature. And his next project is Lucy and Andy Neanderthal. Did I get that right? And that's coming out from uh, Random, House. Random House. And you probably know who I'm talking about. When does your plane leave? Seven o'clock. So please give a warm and quick welcome to Jeffrey Brown. Just one key. Did, did we not get this mic? Okay, there's the There's the mic, everybody. Sorry. That's okay, that's fine. That's fine. Thank you. And thanks for all your work this weekend. My yeah, my my lighter includes like a fresh mic whenever I talk. So and we throw it away. <laughs> Good, good. So excited. What's going, what's going to happen here? No one can know. No one could possibly know. See that? There it is. That's the problem. Here it comes. Jeffrey Brown, everybody. Hi. Okay. Um, so this first story is. Um, from a mini comic I did back in 2012. And it's autobiographical, but it, it touches in Star Wars too. Um, because I know uh, people like Star Wars. In elementary school, I loved recess in the winter. I could finally reenact the Hoth scenes from Star Wars. Hoth is the ice planet. <laughs> Adats, run! I also played a lot of football. 
uh, my best friend Scott was always quarterback, and I was the tight end. Yeah, high five. One winter. Scott, Scott, I I'm open. Whoosh. Crack. Um, under the snow, apparently, it was solid ice. Ah! Well, uh, ah! Do you think I'd notice I'm not playing? <laughs> um, yeah, the only one who, who came up to me was the outsider kid. Um, <laughs> and he just stood there and looked at me. Uh, are you okay? No! I had a broken wrist. Um, he just kind of stood there and looked at me still. <laughs> um, but the last time I hung out with my friend Scott was the summer before sixth grade. This, this might get a little heavy. Uh, you boys can pick something to watch. That's Scott's dad. Scott and I were going to different schools next year. Scott, let's get Star Trek too. Me, let's get Lord of the Rings, the animated Ralph Bakshi cartoon. It's classic. I haven't seen it. Scott's dad, I knew, was a Tolkien fan because they had the Tolkien treasury. Jeff's our guest, so we'll get Lord of the Rings. This is stupid. You're an idiot, Jeff. Now, Scott. You're stupid, Jeff. This is crappy. This sucks. Scott's brother came down. Uh, he could tell his brother was upset. What's wrong, Scott? Just making us watch this stupid crap, but I wanted to rent Star Trek. What, he wanted to watch a cartoon for babies? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know why he wanted to watch this. He's fat, just like a hobbit. Look, he's crying. <laughs> he's crying because Frodo had his finger bitten off. <laughs> I knew it was the end of the fellowship. <laughs> I don't care. I want to see the whole thing. There was one other movie I desperately wanted to see when I was a kid. Oh, boy. It's on TV tonight. The Ewok special. <laughs> I can't wait. I can't. It's... Mom, what time is it? What's I, I can't wait. The Ewok special, it's on 8, 8 o'clock. What time is it? What time is it, Mom? Jeff, I told you we're going to finish shopping first. I, I know. I just, I just want to know what time it is because I'm so excited. It's the Ewok movie. Jeff, enough. But Mom, it's just like, Jeff, I've had it up to here. Stop bugging me. Uh, but Mom, I, I wasn't saying what, we need to go now. I just, I just, that's it, Jeff. I warned you. You're not allowed to watch it now. But Mom, no. That's not, I said no, stop crying. But, 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 mom, no, it's, it's not fair, I just, you had your chance, Jeff. <laughs> stop it, Jeff, or you're going to lose more privileges. Now I'll never see the Ewok TV special. I was just sitting on the couch in like the other room, and I could see my brothers watching it. Um, but, happy ending. I did eventually see it, or unhappy ending, if you've seen it. <laughs> um, so I've got a couple more stories for you. This next one is another mini comic I did. Batman legal team up. Um, not for sale because I didn't. This one wasn't official. Uh, so what time is it? What is it this time? More civil lawsuits for damages because I can pay. I've got the money. Uh, surprisingly, no. First, the Museum of Natural Science is assuming for possession of your T-Rex. <laughs> what? That's my dinosaur. Uh, we'll come up with an appropriate sounding defense. Yeah, just tie them up in appeals forever or something. What else? Uh, your insurance is denying your latest claim for broken ribs and gunshot wounds. What? But isn't that what insurance is for? And the DA sent a note thanking you so much for catching the Joker again. Oh, that's nice. It's good to be appreciated. I think he was being sarcastic. What? I've got the Joker like two dozen times. Exactly. They keep having to let him go because he never testify. <laughs> Fine. I'll testify. 
against my client. No, wait. I'm Batman. <laughs> uh, Batman, we gave you a card, remember, with the Miranda rights? Do you not have it? Yeah, 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 it's here. It's been in my utility belt. It's a little wrinkled. It's kind of hard to read. Case dismissed. <laughs> but I'm Batman. Nice one, Dark Knight. Um, and this last story, um, you know, I've been, um, I, some of you may have heard, I'm working on my own sci-fi series, and um, I'm really excited about it. Uh, after I finish this Neanderthal series, I'm working on this picture book. Um, I'm going to get to it, and I'm, it's, uh, it's going to be the most innovative thing I think I've ever done. Um, and so you guys are going to get the very first look at my new sci-fi series, The UFO Encounter. <laughs> I changed my signature for it. Look, it's a UFO! Grand Rapids, Michigan, 8 p.m. Screech! What in the world was that? I know, it was a UFO. It's a, it's a, the text is very meta because it's like, UFO, by its nature, you don't know, but he knows. <laughs> but it's a UFO. He knows it's a UFO. It's like, I was really happy when I came up with that. It's like really. <laughs> Meanwhile, at the local police station. <sighs> oh, jeez. <laughs> ah, I hate this. <laughs> You'd like to report a UFO? I'll get right on it. The next morning. Hey, Chuck, we got another UFO report. What's it say? I have no idea where these guys are, because um, I realized if I don't make a background, you guys can make this like happen where you know. Like, so it'll be like you're there with, like, so you could imagine this is in your living room or <laughs> your office. Um, so it's part of my, my new strategy to make comics more interactive. <laughs> and it wasn't because I was lazy. It says that a young man spotted an oval UFO on some high. Uh, I apologize, that should be an oval UFO. He stopped to see what it was. The UFO <laughs> had flashing lights. It's probably just nothing, maybe a, a lightning ball. You're right, it usually is something natural. Yeah, it's probably just a, a plane or something. Um, also, you'll notice that I did everything for this. I inked it, scripted the cover, I drew it, lettered it, colored it, <laughs> all me. It could be a number of things, an airplane, a lightning ball, a blimp. Okay then, we'll leave it alone. Meanwhile, <laughs> this is actually pretty amazing, that blue to yellow coloring. It's like, that's, an, that's really clever. <laughs> Use that sometime. Later. Message for you, Hank. It's urgent. Thanks, Bill. What? A UFO spotted coming towards us. I better tell Chuck. Gary, sound of the alarm. <laughs> UFO is coming. I was like, Hank, Bill, Chuck, and Gary, apparently. <laughs> no idea who these guys are. <laughs> and we thought it was a meteor. Uh, uh, uh. Chuck, a UFO has been spotted. It's coming towards us. 
So <laughs> Chuck is either like the TV guy or like the guy in charge, I'm not sure. <laughs> Seconds later, attention everybody. Report outside, a UFO has been sighted coming toward us. Please stay calm, report outside. Soon, UFO studies. I probably should have set that up that they were at the UFO studies place <laughs> earlier. But now you know, so it'll make reading it the second time more interesting. <laughs> but finally, UFO studies. Look, it's the UFO! It's gonna land! Attention humans, I mean you no harm. I have no real purpose here on Earth. I've only come to say this. You have been wrong. You are right. Sometimes UFOs are airplanes, but sometimes they aren't. Many times you cannot identify what a UFO is. I think pretty much every time, because that's what a UFO is. Sometimes you can, but many times these UFO contain, UFOs contain other creatures like myself. So from now on, you must be more careful. The end! Uh, thank you. Very exciting. Thank you so much. Now catch your plane. So if you see a UFO on the way home, talk to Jeffrey. <laughs> Bye. Our next performer. I found all my notes, so we're in good shape. Our next performer has won two Ignace Awards for her uh, work, The Oven, and for House of Women, Part One. Her work has also appeared in various publications, including Best American Comics, Fable Comics, The Pitchfork Review, and many more. Please welcome Sophie Goldstein. Oh, and friends. Can you trade off microphones, or should we get you some more? Okay, great. I'm sure you can. Please introduce your friend. I'm Sophie. This is Emmy Guinness and Jackie Roche. So uh, they are also talented cartoonists, and the correct spelling of their name will be displayed in one of these slides. <laughs> exciting. The drama is, will the mic be shared equally? <laughs> uh, we could probably get another one. Oh, no, I, I'm, I'm just joking. It'll be fine. Let's get Stagecraft. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. Right. Get a super short setup for this. My apologies. That's fine. Any questions about UFOs? <laughs> Jeffrey's gone. I can't answer. I also do science fiction, so I will answer questions about UFOs. <laughs> so let me know. How often can they be identified? Sorry, could you say that again? How often can UFOs be identified, Sophie? Uh, by the very nature of the UFO, uh, it is impossible to identify, <laughs> or, there, or when identified, they cease being a UFO, so catch 22. You're good at this. <laughs> <laughs> I just appreciate the question. Don't we all? It's, it's spinning. You can see the little, it's good. It's good. This is a good thing. <laughs> Never open this final. Now presenting Betsy by Sophie Goldstein. Ring. Train arriving. Please step back from the platform edge. Now arriving at platform 257C, Future Incorporated. Bzz. How was your weekend? Oh, it was great. This space suit could use a wash. Tell me about it. Zip. Beep. Good morning, Betsy. Ah. How are you? Ah. Let's get started, shall we? Ah. Can you name the blocks? Ah. 
How about just the pyramid? Oh. No? Oh. Can you show me which is the pyramid? Ah. Oh. Huh? Good job, Betsy. Oh. Oh. Okay, honey. Oh. Good morning, class. Today we'll be talking about waste removal. Eyes forward, please. Oh. You know what to do. Oh. Is that one of them? Is it? Henry's doing so well. We're up to verbs. That's wonderful. He'll be E2 at least. I'm not sure of Alice yet. She's not as bright as my last. She was a good egg. But eggs all have to hatch sometime. <laughs> <laughs> Carol. You wanted to see me? There's no sense skirting the issue. Betsy isn't measuring up. Uh, with more time. No, that's simply not possible. It doesn't do to get attached. Remember that. We'll start you with a new unit tomorrow. You might as well go home. No sense finishing the day. Shh. Today is future incorporated announcements. Air quality remains satisfactory within controlled areas. Helmet compliance is at 95% of expected standards and is still mandatory, ladies. Remember to shk, shk. Thank you for Jackie and Emmy for performing this with me. So to all see and cast Jackie Roche and Emmy Chase. Thank you so much. Our next presenter is, has come all the way from Canada. So he knows who he is. And um, he, he has many books out. He has a new book from Drawn and Quarterly, a, a, a revision of his previous book, Nicholas. He's also the author of Bigfoot, Reunion, and Petty Theft. Please welcome Pascal Girard. Do you know anything about UFOs? Yes, I went to... I know a lot because when I was in high school, I went to this kind of a symposium about... <laughs> yeah, like a bunch of guys, and I, I don't know if I believe or anything, but I like to go to those things, so... I, I, it would come back. Not right now. I could, not on the spot. I'm too stressed to talk about it right now. I got, I got stage fry. Well, well, enjoy yourself. That's not. Welcome, Pascal. Thanks, thank you. Well, first, thanks everybody. It's 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 uh, it's my first time at XPX, and it's uh, it's very nice. It's a uh, it's a good weekend, and um, I, I I came here for a revision, like a a new edition of a no book about uh, it's autobiographical about the death of my my brother. And I said, I'm not going to read from that because it's, uh, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's more personal and thing. But I have, I have a story that's also autobiographical. And uh, you will see how it go along. It seemed crazy, but it's a, it's a true story. And you will learn a lot about me in it. So it's called The Osteopath. And this is the Drawn Quality Bookstore. It's in Montreal. So that's, that's a real place. You can see I sit in a set in a real place. Um, that's me. I lost that hat. I had a hat like that. Yes. Oh, I'm, I'm not as good as reading. I'm not going to be like, I'm going to talk the whole way, you see, like that. <laughs> she's she laughing and she's texting. The phone is yellow. I don't know if there's any iPhone or yellow or something. That's a strange thing. So uh, that's what I do. You will, I, I'm, I, I'm not polite with phone. I'm always looking at, at what people look and phone. And that's true. That's, I, I, and I know it's impolite, but I do it. So, and I look. And I'm... Uh, so that's, that's my bag. That's the, that's the real bag. Yeah, I still got that bag. See, those are the real color. But, so then it's come up from my bag. 
the color are very, oh, no, they're not that bad. It's watercolor, so I, some, normally on screen it's not, it's, not, it's not that bad. Ah, so she gets scared, I was like, creeping. Yes, what? Uh, no, no, I didn't call you. Five times. Huh. Uh, normally I speak in French, so all this, all this dialogue in real life would be in French. <laughs> My phone must pocket dial you. Sorry. Yeah, I don't know. It unlock in itself sometime. Okay, I will join you after my appointment. Uh, that's a treat. Okay. This is music. Still creeping. Uh, and the osteopath, that was the room like that, and you have to wait in your... It's not on the wear, it's like short. Okay, and you look like that for real. Uh, push, breathe in, breathe out. Anyone went to the osteopath before? No. Yeah. It, I'm sure it's great. I go to the chiropractor all the time. I got a good relationship with the chiropractor, but the osteopath, that was a strange one, you see. Breathe in, push, push. And see, he's, he's starting to uh, push, and you get this sort of, that, that's kind of a panic attack. I can, uh, yeah, yeah that's sort of panic attack. I, I, got, I, I don't have this kind of thing like stage five or anything, but uh, every time I go to the barber or, or this kind of thing, when someone touch you like that in a, a massage, that's, that's not good. So, <laughs> Pascal, push! Oh, uh, sorry, uh, listen to me, please. He was upset. He thought I wasn't listening to him, but I almost, I fainted, <laughs> I think. Anyway, I felt like my back hurt even more after seeing him. Well, no wonder, look how you're sitting. What do you mean? Uh, I'm not going to draw like this. I can't even see what I'm doing. Draw bigger. <laughs> I draw very small. I got a standing drawing table, so it's good for the back. I don't know if I will go see him again after tomorrow's appointment. We don't really connect. Connect with your osteopath? Of course, it's important. I think it's true. And I sort of pass out on his table during the session. What? Why? I don't know. I got uncomfortable. It happened to me sometime. Once with a physio, twice with a dentist, <laughs> at the barber. It's important to trust the professional you're fainting with. <laughs> I don't think I say that in real life. That's too... I got a message. What is that? It's just a long message of someone breathing heavily. <laughs> ah, it's from my osteopath. <laughs> yeah, that's still true. It's all true. Why would he do that? Oh, shit. What? What? My, f my phone pocket dialed him 23 times. <laughs> you stupid phone. <laughs> That's true, 22. Why don't we get a smartphone like everybody else? It's funny because the guy who say that in real life is a friend and he doesn't, like, he doesn't even have a phone anymore after, like he doesn't even have a smartphone. Must happen on my way here, my phone was in my bag. That is a strange message to leave to a client, not very professional, you sound like a lunatic. You have to cancel your next appointment, you don't connect anyway. I can't, it's in less than 24 hours, I would lose 100 bucks if I did. I got insurance, I got a day job, so that's not true, I wouldn't lose it. And even if he's upset, he's not going to do anything. What can he do? A lot. Osteopath are like magician. <laughs> breathe in, push, breathe out, breathe. <laughs> Crack, so. so he's like in a nursing home. Right? <laughs> breathe in, breathe out. Okay, that's enough. This is completely ridiculous. I'm 32 years old. I'm going to be 35, so this and I will solve the problem like an adult. Oh, uh, okay, mm, sorry, my phone will change it soon. Said, voila. Sometimes a tiny little problem grow bigger than it should be. It's just 23 stupid pocket, uh, pocket dial phone call, who cares? You didn't answer. Hope you will see it before a session. Pascal, ah, your turn. How's your back since yesterday? It's, it's fine. Did you read my email? Your email? You can lie on the table and relax. I have a little phone call to make before we start. <laughs> what do I do? What do I do? That's, that's where it's not true anymore. <laughs> just escape. So, the osteopath never called me back and he never answered my email. That was the last time I saw him. The real thing is I got my appointment, but he never like addressed the thing, and he never addressed that he phoned me back. I, I never know what's the truth about that. <laughs> and he never answered my email after that, so after that I didn't went to see him again. I'm sure he's good, but that was very strange. <laughs> Another true story, almost, on just the end, where I, I didn't do the, the real thing. 
I think it's like John Porcelino, like what he said, that another true story, but yeah. So the back still hurt. Thank you. We learn about a lot in these shows. We cover a lot of ground, I must say. Our next performer is a, a late addition to the list, but perhaps you saw, well, you certainly saw her up there. She has um, come all the way from Philadelphia. And uh, yes, Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. Let's hear it for Philadelphia. And um, oh, I'm so sorry. Everything's taking me a long time today. She is an illustrator and cartoonist. You probably figured that out. Uh, her work has been published by Toon Books, Locus Moon Press, The Nib, SpongeBob Comics, Penguin Books, and many others. Her first book, Why Would You Do That, is out now from Hick and Hock. Please welcome Andrea Sarumi. <laughs> now you have two for us. I don't know which one you want to do first. Probably hometown. Okay. Makes sense. Do you know? Do you any, Do you know anything about osteopaths? Uh, I think your wife would know more about osteopaths. I know, but she's not here. I Here's Andrea Sarumi. Hey. I'm no good at vamping, sorry. Um, thank you guys for coming out, and thank you for coming to this. Um, so I'm going to read you two comics. Uh, the first one is as personal or serious as I'm going to go, which is not very. And the second one is completely ridiculous. Um, or maybe I've got those mixed up, but you'll figure it out. Uh, the first one is called Hometown, and it's kind of about growing up in a town in the Hudson River Valley, um, but it's also not my real town and not me, so um, I will stop blathering. Hmm town, Irvingdale, population 10,875, established 1707, the most haunted town in the county. I've lived here all my life. In 1715, a woman fell off her horse, exposing herself. A man shielded her bottom with his hat, which is an actual historical thing that happened in my actual hometown, but not here. In 1982, my uncle fell off the bleachers onto his coach, breaking his arm in two places. We've got a ton to cover tonight, folks. The Banshee, the Red House, Screaming Lizzie, the Limping Ghost, and of course, our Headless Horseman. Who's got questions before we start? Why is that horse statue's junk painted blue? <laughs> ah. In 1795, they cut down all the trees in Cooper Woods. In 1995, I tried to kiss Josh, and he ran away. We paint them every year, but someone always paints them back. Moving on. In 1957, Dennis Beacon drove his car into an oak tree at the library. The tree is still there. 1999, ninth grade. 2000, 10th grade. 2001, 11th grade. 2002, 12th grade. I'll leave here in three months. Her parents buried her in St. Paul's, but her baby hasn't been found to this day. Honk. I didn't have friends in eighth grade. In ninth, Ben and Molly got me a slushy after I got my wisdom teeth out. I saved the straw. Our headless horseman isn't as big as that other one. Ours was a rich farmer riding home drunk who got robbed and murdered. His killers were hanged and also haunt the town. So it was kind of a wash. Parks closed, go home. Screaming Lizzie got torn in half by a cannonball and died a hero, but the horseman's still more famous. Does an ending matter, or is it just one more thing after another? In fact, she's here to tell you herself. Hi, the redcoats are here. <laughs> Has anyone ever washed this costume? Well, it's supposed to smell like someone died in it. Ha, ha. Is it time for the ghost to get burritos yet? Molly, you coming? No, Ray and I are gonna go get donuts. In 1843, a beggar drowned in a creek. He became the limping ghost. In 1943, Susan's grandpa watched his house burn down. Then he walked to the diner for coffee. Lie down, I don't see any cars. I told mom I wouldn't want to raise kids here and she got upset. You think you'll ever do that? No one moves back here, they just visit. What the hell are you girls doing? Jay Booker, the elastics inventor, founded the first cat cemetery in the country in 1898. Eight ghosts have been seen in the Red House, all women. There's a knocking sound on the stairs that's unexplained. Some say it's trapped ghosts, but most think it's... 
One month left. My neighbor tries to humiliate his wife whenever they're in public. He even turned his dog mean, and it was a golden retriever. There's an old couple that dances in the pool lot at night. It's nice. Before we start, any question? Is there a gift shop? Washington lost a battle at Bay Street. 43 men died. Then it became a mill, then a theater, then a bar. Then in the 70s, it became a spa where the staff dealt coke in the locker rooms. It was empty for a while, and then it became our first video store, which is closing. This winter, Susan wanted to surprise Ben by throwing snowballs at his window at night. She saw it in a movie or something. After the first three, the backlight snapped on, and Ben's dad ran out at us waving a baseball bat in his boxers. Kissing noises. Um, the food's ri You guys can disengage. The horseman rides again. Oh my god, Susan. Ha ha, hurry. Oh crap, oh crap. Susan! Don't tell my parents. Is she okay? Oh god, where are my clothes? The first aid kit's in the car. Just... My favorite teacher, Ms. Swan, got sick and died last year. The town named a road for her, but someday people will call it Swan Road and not know why. And no one new will know or care about any of these stories unless there's a murder in them. And that's all right. Okay, so that's hometown, and now we have something else. Thank you. And where's cake and pie? Okay, so this, oh God. Nope. Oh, did you not look at the beginning? Yeah, I'll do it, sorry. You got it? I think so, I hope the music will work. versus pie.
All right, thank you very much. <laughs> Our next guest uh, has worked on franchises such as The Muppet Show, Thor, and Popeye, as well as producing hundreds of pages of his own comics, often featuring his character Fred the Clown. In 2012, he won an Eisner Award for his series Snarked. Please welcome. Roger Langdridge. Langdridge. Do you, do you vote for pie or cake? Um, can I have pike? Yes, you can. I guess. How are you? I'm good, thank you. We're watching the screen open. It'll get there. Any other UFO questions? Never mind, we got it. We're good. Please welcome Roger. How does it work? <laughs> okay. You can keep applause. Um, this is, uh, what I'm going to show you is, it's, I was going to say it's a work in progress, but it's not even that. Um, it's, it's sort of test pages for something that I want to do, and I'm sort of trying out some styles and things. So um, it's about the poet William McGonagall. Don't know if you've heard of him. He's supposed to be the worst poet who ever lived. So. Um, yeah, it's, it's not too bad. Most of it's centered. So I think okay. okay. Yeah. Here's Roger. All right, I, I may attempt an accent. Um, it, it'll be, it won't be authentic, it'll be sort of Willie the Gardener from The Simpsons, if anything. <laughs> Gribblies, I'm nae pulling your tadger. William Topaz McGonagall, 1825 to 1902, was a dundee weaver, amateur actor, and lifelong teetotaler. His enduring legacy is of being regarded as the worst poet in the history of the English language. McGonagall claimed that when he was 52 years old, he was seized by a vision in which God told him to devote his life to writing poetry. But, but I know nothing of poetry. Don't let a little thing like that stop you. <laughs> he didn't. For the next quarter century, he gave the whole of his energies to writing and performing his poems, despite displaying no talent for the former. Your central girders would not have given way, at least many sensible men do say, had they been supported on each side with buttresses, at least many sensible men confesses. <laughs> That's an actual poem, I didn't make that up. <laughs> and Augusto for the latter, the, the latter being uh, performing them, which often placed his audience in grave peril. <laughs> he was ne never short of fruit. So that's sort of the introduction to get you to know the character. There's probably gonna be a few more pages of that sort of thing. Um, this is an episode which sort of leads into the big story that I want to tell, which is like a, a prologue to it. The Great McGonagall, world's worst poet. A bogus busico. That's how you pronounce it, I looked it up. Dundee, 1880. Dash it all, woman! It's been two years since my vision divine! When will fame and recognition be mine? Remove the giblets from this chicken, will you dear? I think it's time to go off. That's not an authentic accent. I <laughs> Despite never having written a word of poetry in my life, I was chosen. But out from its rewards, I have been frozen. Never mind, I'll do it myself. <laughs> What's this? A delivery of Her Majesty's post and a letter for me. I could, I don't know why I'm there. It died. Your computer died. It's so exciting. We'll fix it. 
The suspense. <laughs> the suspense. Is our tech person here? Oh, here it comes. We're getting there. We're getting it. Thank you for your patience. We never know if you became famous or not. <laughs> no. Oh, we will, we will find out. <laughs> one, one century, I guess we'll find out. It seems to be connected again, so. Good. You guys the Wi Fi. Does that pop up? Oh, is that what it is? All right, yeah. fine. Yeah, I turned it off. I got it. One, two. Yeah, I turned it off. I turned it off. We're good. Thank you. Again, a big round of applause for the people who do all the tech work up here. <laughs> okay. There we go. All right. You'll have to find your yeah. spot. Yeah. Who is through? Um, here we go. What's this? A delivery of Her Majesty's Post? And a letter for me I can truly boast. Thank you, Jamie, my merry young man. Help yourself to a sugar lump from the can. Why, it's from the theatrical impresario, Mr. Dion Boussicot. He is in Dundee and would dine with me. At last, my poetic gifts will not be left on the shelf. Perhaps he wishes me to tour the provinces or even London itself. That's all very well, but have you done the pins? The day of the meeting arrives. This is the address that was vouchsafed to me. But where could Mr. Busico possibly be? Oi, where you going to go? That's not an authentic accent either, just in case you want. <laughs> Certainly I am he, but you have the advantage over me. It's my friend Jim Cobblers. I used to weave at the factory. I bought you a pie. Why, I... hush, friend. I'm now working for Mr. Busico. He's waiting for you upstairs. Oh, I'm most grateful. This meeting may prove to be extremely fateful. Okay, fruity actor voice now. Ah, the great McGonagall himself. Delighted, sir. Mr. Busico, I am pleased to hear that my poems have reached your theatrical ear. Now, now, sir, your fame grows by the very day. Your talent has earned the respect of the entire theatrical establishment. These words are a thrill to be told. Your praise is most heartening to behold. Let us get down to brass tacks, sir. I propose a tour of the provinces. What are your terms? I have always just asked for donations to pay my way. Pray allow me to consider for a moment, if I may. It seems to me that I must not ask too little, for they might think me a fool at whom merely to giggle. And yet I must not be too greedy, despite the fact that for funds I am always needy. Mm. Having most carefully thought it through, for seven shows a week, I asked for a nightly fee of pounds, two. Two pounds. Two pounds! <laughs> Etc. <laughs> My dear fellow, an artist of your talent, dare I say, genius, should not perform more than four times a week for fear of inducing inflammation of the brain. Shall we say 20 pounds per week plus five pounds up front for a new wardrobe? Oh, aye, aye, most exciting. May I have that in writing? All in good time, sir. First, I must insist you give us a rendition of your poem, The Battle of Bannockburn. <laughs> Who are all these people, my man? A free performance was not part of the plan. Why, your admirers, my dear McGonagall. A few of your sterling effusions would truly make our night. He did, in fact, call them effusions. That is what he called his poems. <laughs> But I have no costume, you see. And what of the meal that was promised to me? In your letter, you mentioned the dinner. I feel myself, by the moment, growing thinner. Sir, I regarded you as a professional. Is my faith in you misplaced? You shall dine after your performance. Ah, well. The Battle of Bannockburn. By daybreak, the whole of the English army came in view, consisting of archers and horsemen, bold and true. The main body was led on by King Edward himself, an avaricious man and fond of pelf. I had to look that up. It means ill-gotten gains, apparently. Forget me not. 
So he leaped into the river wide and swam across to the other side to fetch a flower for his young bride who watched him eagerly on the other side. These are all real poems. I did not make these poems up. Addressed to the moon. Beautiful moon with thy silvery light, thou cheerest the farmer in the night and makes his heart beat high with delight as he views his crops by the light in the night. <laughs> Hooray! I feel I have earned that dinner most dearly. That last performance killed me nearly. And now, my dear Mr. McGonagall, the meal you were promised. Ah! This paltry fare is to sustain me. Why do you thus disdain me? And yet, to complain of one's lot is the sport of losers and beggars, to my mind, can all be choosers. Though I shall not partake of strong drink, as alcohol makes a mockery, I truly think. <laughs> Scrunch, scrunch, etc. Chewing noises. But sandwich is pretty poor affair, you know. Still, time to sign the contract. Hello? Next day, I shall track down this busico if it is the last thing I do. The manager of the Theatre Royal should know a thing or two. What do you know of this sinner? This bounder owes me a dinner. A grievous ac accusation indeed. Allow me to examine the letter. Whee! This is not from Dean Busico. Busico has never been to Dundee. It must be a forgery, sir. Apparently, wife, it was a hoax most cruel. I have been tricked and played for a fool. Never mind, dear, I've got some lovely tripe on the boil. We understand that the poet has put the... They used inverted commas in the actual newspaper article. That's... <laughs> we understand that the <coughs> poet has put the matter in the hands of the authorities who are busily engaged investigating into these circumstances. And we can assure the authors of this heartless hoax on a poor struggling genius, I'm surprised I didn't use inverted commas there, that they may yet be called upon to stand the <coughs> poet a good dinner to compensate him for the one he was so shabbily cheated and deprived of. The end. So dramatic. Did you plan for the, for the PowerPoint to stop like that in the middle? I think that was actually my fault. It was very, very dramatic. So uh, I know it's 4.56. Can I show one more piece? Is that great? Thank you. Um, as you know, I've been trying to get the Wi-Fi to work in here, and they warned me it didn't work. So I can't show you Carol Tyler's video, but you can see it on Vimeo. There was an exhibit of her work, and she wanted to show you the the trailer for the exhibit. So look up Carol Tyler on Vimeo and you should be able to find it. Or email me and complain and I'll send you the link. Um, but uh, speaking of poetry, I wanted to show you one more piece. Um, I recently adapted the iTunes terms and conditions into a graphic novel. And <laughs> while it literally takes three hours to read out loud, and I have done that, um, I, I wanted to show you some highlights. So this will only take three minutes. So we'll just, we're going to skim through the first 36 pages. It's, it's a breeze. To agree to these terms, click agree. If you do not agree to these terms, do not click agree and do not use the services. You agree that you will pay for all products you purchase through the services. Unused balances are not transferable. Certain transactions and features may not be compatible with earlier software and may require a software upgrade. Not all products, including in-app purchases, content that is not available for re-download, subscriptions, and some previously purchased apps are eligible for family sharing. Accounts for persons under 13 years old can be created by a parent or legal guardian using family sharing or by an approved educational institution.
on an associated device that is not push enabled, iTunes eligible content will automatically appear in the download queue and you may manually initiate the download within iTunes. We're doing great, we're about halfway through. Matched or uploaded songs and related metadata will be available for access from an associated device that has been enabled for iTunes Match. You agree not to access the iTunes service by any means other than through software that is provided by Apple for accessing the iTunes service. You shall not access or attempt to access an account that you are not authorized to access. The full price of the Season Pass, Multipass, or iTunes Pass is charged upon purchase. Apple may provide links to third-party websites as a convenience to you. You expressly agree that your use of or inability to use the iTunes service is at your sole risk. Apple reserves the right at any time to modify this agreement and to impose new or additional terms or conditions on your use of the iTunes service. Notices shall become effective immediately. Thank you so much, everybody. That's our show. Thank you so much to my guests. Sophie Goldstein, Carol Tyler, Roger Langridge, Pascal Girard, Andrea Sarumi, Jeffrey Brown, and thanks again to our tech crew. I really appreciate you guys. Thanks for setting this up. I know it's a lot of work. You have one hour remaining to buy every comic in this building. Go. Thank you.